Welcome back. I'm Sam Hedden, and we have a very special guest. His name is Adam Wahlberg. He is a mental health advocate, a writer, and the founder of Think Peace Publishing. He does amazing work. He's got to work with some amazing people, and I am really excited for you to get to meet him. Hi, thanks for joining me. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Are you from Minnesota? I am a native. I uh, uh, grew up in Lino Lakes, right next to a, I lived right next to a cemetery and down the street from a prison. So uh, it was quite a childhood. And I went to Forest Lake High School and uh, then St. Cloud State for college. And I, I didn't really discover writing until pretty deep into my college career. When I started out as a business major and I would have been a terrible business major. I kind of just lucked into this really great role. I worked at this um, magazine. I went to the legal and political community, which would sound kind of dry, but we were really irreverent. Our, our, it was called Minnesota Law and Politics, and our slogan was, only our name is boring. <laughs> so <laughs> we covered these kind of really intense, dry topics, but with a little irreverence. It was kind of a mix of the onion and the New Yorker. And <laughs> and I loved it. I did that for 16 years and I loved it. I'd still be doing it today, except uh, the company got sold. But that kind of, in my 20s and 30s, sent me down this journalism path. And uh, that's kind of how I got into writing and journalism and publishing. Any mentors or like figures that you were like, oh, I really like that writing. That's who I want to be like one day when I grow up. You know, I, I discovered a love of reading through reading sports books and reading Sports Illustrated. And there's a, a couple of Sports Illustrated writers from me growing up that I just loved. I mean, Sports Illustrated, when they were in their prime, they would do these, they would sometimes do these 10,000 word profiles that uh, would really illuminate the subject. And uh, I just thought it was like little mini books. So I grew up like just devouring Sports Illustrated, uh, as far as really vivid, conversational, um, magazine style writing, and of all things, me later working at a magazine, that kind of informed me of that kind of style, which is smart, but not too dry, not too academic, but it's storytelling. You're trying to reveal the person. So yeah, uh, there's a guy named Gary Smith, who was a, a Sports Illustrated writer that I just love, love, loved. And then uh, he was my first kind of literary crush i just uh uh you know adored him and uh you know i love jd salinger and then once i got into my career my boss at law and politics is a guy named steve kaplan who he's the most influential person in my career by far he, his approach to writing his kind of tone his sense of humor uh, he was able to write about i mean we the magazine covered important topics, but we always said it shouldn't be like eating your vegetables. So <laughs> it would have these little touches either in the headline or some of the transitions. It would be like a long piece about tort reform or something, but it would, it would kind of have a, a, a tone to it, a flavor for it. You, you didn't, um, you weren't it, bored sleep. You weren't like bored to sleep by reading it. No, no. And so that was, you weren't, and that that's taken me, that's kind of my approach to this day from the, you know, the things I do is like, you, you can talk about anything. I mean, as you mentioned, I, I later went on to do these uh, books on mental health topics, which, you know, scare everybody. No one really likes talking about them, but what I had been trained to do with law and politics was like, well, why do they have to be so scary? I mean, I, I it's not to take these topics frivolously or casually, and but you can talk about these subjects that are in most people's families. It doesn't have to be scary. Not many people go on to create a publishing company. Usually I imagine that there was a moment where you're like, I can do this. Was there a moment like that for you? After the magazine that I really loved got sold, I had this other job that I did not like and I was a pretty unhappy fellow and I knew I had to make a change. And the aha moment was I was Skyping with a friend of mine who's a journalist. He lives on the other side of the country. And uh, this all sounds kind of naive, but it, everyone, I'm, you know, I'm an anxious guy by nature. I'm not someone who takes a lot of risks, like, all the time. At the time, I thought, well, I, 
why couldn't you do books that help people and then just connect it to readers on social media? That was my whole brainstorm. And again, back in 2003, or I think I said 2003, 2013, you know, it really was just like, hey, you know, I couldn't you just make a book visible on Facebook and Twitter if you're good at content and nurturing an audience that way and, and building it up slowly. And I, I just couldn't stop thinking about that. It's the only entrepreneurial thought I've ever had in my life. <laughs> but I couldn't stop thinking of it. I didn't like quit and do it right away. I spent a year thinking about it. And I just thought, well, I had a little bit of savings at the time. I just thought, why couldn't I reinvent myself as an indie book guy and then try to do books that help people? Because I also have this advocacy itch I wanted to scratch. Uh, I mean, journalism has been great, but I always thought if I didn't go into that, I'd want to be like a campaign worker for, you know, uh, an outreach coordinator. <laughs> yeah, exactly. for, like, uh, I, I'm, with journalism, the whole thing is you're not supposed to be partisan. You're not supposed to phone bank or do lit drops, but I like doing that. Like I, I was also a poli sci guy in college and you can't do that as a journalist. And I wanted to, and I thought, so the aha moment was, why couldn't I be an advocate indie publisher? Um, and it could be on any issue. It actually didn't start out as a mental health mission. I thought it could be on any issue. I thought it could be on race relations or um, disability. I, you know, I, I, I left thinking, I'll just approach some authors I know because of my journalism career and see if they have something they, you know, want to say. And could I just learn how to put together a book, which you can use all these tools that are available through self-publishing, but brand it as a site, and then just try to connect it to readers on social. And that was the whole game plan. And so when I left, uh, that was a thought. It was, it was kind of like I just took a deep breath and dived in, and I made a million mistakes early on. And then uh, like the first three projects I wanted to do all blew up in my face. And I'm like, well, this isn't going well, but I it felt good to me. It felt like, I think I could do this because I wanted to get into, I wanted to do books that had an outcome, a social outcome. And it felt right. It, I can't say it felt right to me, even in those first couple of years where I just was like, not having any success with projects. It always felt like the real me. It, it, it felt like this is exactly what I want to be doing. This kind of combination of being, um, I mean, like Paul Wellstone was my hero growing up. He's my hero to this day. My, my heroes weren't writers. They were, activists and so uh, I wanted to get into that game but doing it through publishing so what made you decide mental health like what was I mean like you said you could have picked from a variety of different like topics why mental health how was that the one that you ended up with I, I've had anxiety issues through my life and I had a very formative year in 2008 where I had a pretty serious breakdown and it it never really interfered with my life until it came for me in a big way. And it was in 2008. It just out of the blue was there. And it, what it is, I think it was situational. How it manifested is I had this terrible struggle with insomnia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's terrible. And then like even medication wasn't knocking it back. And I, I'm a total guilty Catholic um, neurotic that I just think I should, should be able to handle everything and be perfect. And that was a big lesson for me that <laughs> I couldn't accept the fact that I couldn't shut off my brain to sleep and I didn't want to be on meds, which is now strikes me as silly. And so I was in the struggle to like, uh, and then because I, I had this shame about being on meds back then, the meds wouldn't work. But after a couple months, like I lost like 40 pounds. I was like scaring my whole family. I was clearly hypomanic and, uh, and I was suicidal. I definitely did not want to continue with, I couldn't use my brain. I couldn't read a sentence. I, I'd never been confronted with the fact that I'm awake 22 hours a day for six weeks and that takes things from you. But what got me through is they ended up giving me another med. And I was like, I don't even want to be on the first med. <laughs> but all these people in my life were like, Adam, quit being a perfectionist. You're in trouble here. Um, mm -hmm. And the second med they added on worked. I ended up getting like six hours of sleep that night. I'll never forget it. I thought, wow. 
And to this day, 12 years later, I'm still on the same two meds. Um, so I'm a, but, and then, but you don't just recover from having all these dark thoughts. So it took me a while and then I thought, well, you know, at a certain point I want to use this experience to be helpful. I don't know how that will look. And again, this was in 2008 and it took me until 2012. But again, with Think Peace Publishing, it started as just kind of, it was very broad. It just was supposed to be about social issues and personal stories on something. First three projects I did blew up in my face and I'm like, wow, this is not going well. But the fourth, I got a chance to work with a pretty well-known national author named Janet Burroway. Her agent got a hold of me because he saw the website and said he's got this janet's got a book about losing her son to suicide he was a a military guy and it's called losing tim and they couldn't sell it even though she's a really big name she's been up for national book award um a pulitzer but no one would buy this because it's a scary topic it's not exactly going to likely be a big seller right and the agent couldn't sell it to anybody else so he thought well i'll just reach out to this one man Minneapolis indie publishing guy. And I read up on Janet and thought, well, she's a genius. And then they sent me the book and I read it in one sitting. And I just thought, this is one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. It's called Losing Tim. I mean, she plays at a really high level. It's like reading a Joan Didion book. And I just thought, well, this, I got to do this. I get a chance to put out this book by this really, you know, um, well-known revered literary figure she actually wrote this writing textbook when she was a professor that's the most taught writing textbook in the country and so yeah she's literally probably the most influential writing professor of the last century because she taught the book that's in all the universities and and so she's a genius and her book is so beautiful but very painful and then i met her and we liked each other and i I said janet i don't know what i'm doing I, i have this idea that I can make your book visible on social media using content strategies and, and making a beautiful book and doing media relations like a maniac. And, uh, and I loved it. It gave me energy. And it then that's what focused everything after losing Tim, I suddenly got a chance to do all these other mental health projects. And then I, so I tightened the focus. I was like, all right, you know, from that point forward, it was all mental health. And it, again, it, it drew me back to 2008, which is like, oh, of course it should be. I know these stories. I know what it's like to feel that lost and that scared. I, that's what led to the next few projects. What, can you tell us a little bit about those projects? After Janet, a lot of good things happened because people liked your book. Um, critics really liked your book. Uh, I was really proud of it. And I didn't rush it out. I we spent two years designing this kind of scrappy indie campaign and, uh, and it got a lot of attention and that felt good. And then I became known as the indie publisher to Janet Burroway's book because Janet Burroway nationally has a lot of credibility. And suddenly a lot of people got a hold of me. Um, One is Julie Barton and that's its own story. Julie had not published anything before, but she had a manuscript that no one would take seriously. And it's about going through a terrible depression, suicidal, and a dog really helped her therapeutically. And I thought, well, I have to do this. I knew that. Uh, Because it's a tough read. It sounds kind of adorable, but it is a rough read. I mean, she is walking into traffic on page five. The dog doesn't even show up to page 50. And it's, it's a very honest book. There's stuff in there about her brother being abusive is physically and uh, all these things that led to her having, I think these um, um, not great self-esteem. I loved it. I thought it was a, you know, uh, I mean, it's mostly a depression book. I called it uh, a girl interrupted with a dog. And uh, (laughs) it is is an intense, intense book. And yet it does have this, just these elements of um, charm to it. I hardly edited a word. She had the title, which is great, called Dog Medicine. She had the cover of her and her dog Bunker. So these elements were right there. And she wrote a great, great book, a first class book. And people flipped out for it. I mean, we felt it coming like eight months before. 
that uh, this is kind of really connecting with people. And of course, animal therapy is a real thing. And mm-hmm. but I don't know if there at the time was like a really visible public face to that as an issue. And I thought, why couldn't it be Julie? She became like, you know, Ringo Starr. She was like a beetle. She was huge. We, I went out to the West Coast and we did these events and the lines were down the street because we had spent a lot of time on the launch uh, leading up to it on social, like creating the buzz and just sharing what people were saying on the review copies. And people really loved it. And we're like, what is going on? And it got so big within like a couple of weeks, uh, Penguin Random House wanted to buy the rights to it. <laughs> And of all things, Sam, that made me really sad. It should have been like this dream come true, but they kind of had to talk me into it because I loved working on the book. I loved working with Julie and I was very protective of the book. I didn't want to just sell the rights away, but we did because it was the best thing for the book. Mm-hmm. And we got a little bit of money and um, Penguin then took it. And then six months later, we released it. And on the first week, she was a New York Times bestseller. Wow. So it's quite a story, right? And like that all just started with me and this friend of a friend emailing each other saying, well, I'll do it if you do it. And she was like, well, I'll do it if you do it. And I'm like, well, (laughs) it's just going to be two people and their laptops and how much energy we have for it. So it was a blast, Sam. It was was more than I could have possibly imagined. And uh, But real quickly on others, I ended up working with Adam Levy of the Honey Dogs, who's a musician in town. He had a book about losing his son Daniel to suicide. And Mm -hmm. I decided, I love Adam. I've been a longtime fan of the Honey Dogs. And I knew of the story of Daniel. And I met Adam at a mental health conference. He was Mm -hmm. speaking about Daniel. And he said he had a solo album about Daniel ready to go. And so I approached him and said, well, how much would that cost to put out? And he told me, and I'm like, well, I'll be your label if you, you know, you want, because it fit, right? I'm now full on in on mental health issues. And and I heard as he sent me a Dropbox of the songs, I thought they were amazing. So I spontaneously decided to be a record label, which, <laughs> you know, isn't any great thing on my part. I was basically, I stayed out of Adam's way. I said, you make them album you want and uh, I'll pay for it and that was about it but Nobbin Way came out about the same time as Dog Medicine and you know uh, Nobbin Way's amazing it got Adam's best reviews and he's such a sweetheart of a guy and he was really brave talking about Daniel and that got made quite a splash here locally so it was a lot of fun my 2015 and 16 were like I couldn't believe it. Again, my first three projects were disasters. And then Janet got me in the game. And then Julie and Adam were just like dream projects. And then I got so kind of spooked, Sam, by like how much work I was putting into it. I was getting stressed out again, which felt like the job I left. And I thought, I think I took on a little bit more than I can chew Mm. because I was getting really stressed out and anxious again. And then uh, the last one was really, there was the Mark Malman book about how he got over the grief of losing his mother by listening to feel good music. And I, I love Mark been a fan for 20 years. And I just thought, wow, that's a, that's quite a story. Uh, he had never written a book. He's a musician. I didn't know if he could pull it off, but I said, Mark, if you're willing to just write it, I can't pay you to write it. So it, God bless him. He spent two years writing it on spec in his basement and it was really good. So yeah, those last three are all really tightly focused on mental health. And uh, um, it's just, you know, it it takes a lot of guts to do these things. So I get a chance to be just their biggest fan. My job is to just like cheer them on. And uh, so for me to get a chance to work with folks like Janet and Julie and Mark and Adam, uh, what a pleasure. They're inspiring to me. Every second of every minute of those years of work was just it felt so different than anything else I've done. It felt really good. I mean, I wish I could make a living doing it, but um, it, yeah, it, it's a real honor because you're working with people on their most, in their most vulnerable states and they're willing to share it. Thank you for joining me. Those were amazing stories about some of the amazing things that you've gotten to be a part of and you've been able to do. And I'm really glad that you were able to share them with me today. So thank you for coming on and joining me via Zoom today. 
Well, it's my pleasure, Sam. Thank you. I love your show. And uh, really, uh, I, I'm honored you asked me to, to join. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Now you know an amazing writer, founder of Think Peace Publishing, and an advocate all around. I'm Sam Hedden with producer Andy Watson, and now you know Adam Wahlberg. Or you can do it your way first, and then you can do it my way. Shut up.